English language schools managers, tertiary education administrators, and foreign experts with an opportunity to network, share experience, and as well as uh, discover new teaching ideas. Also, this annual international conference is dedicated to establish a quality hub for sharing ideas of appropriate pedagogies in different teaching and learning contexts, strengthen the ties between the foreign language teaching communities in Vietnam and other nations, connect local communities with international language education institutions or associations, and present state-of-the-art research into language and language education. Ladies and gentlemen, since 2016, OpenTESOL has also published its conference proceedings. All presenters are encouraged to submit their papers for consideration in this publication. We are so happy to receive a large number of articles from many professionals and language teachers. We truly appreciate your tremendous effort, ongoing support, active participation in the event this year. And this highlights the fact that we still have a great impact on TESOL community. Well, first of all, we would like to introduce our keynote speakers of the conference today, Dr. Elizabeth Plummer from American College of Education. <laughs> Dr. Dat Bao from Monash University, Australia. and Mr. Colin Finnerty and Dr. Nathaniel Owen from Oxford University Press. We would also like to introduce to you our sponsors from Regional English Language Office, U.S. Embassy, Hanoi. Oxford University Press. Sengage Learning. National Geographic Learning and Mamilan Education. From Ho Chi Minh City Open University, we would like to introduce Professor Dr. Nguyen Minh Ha, President of Ho Chi Minh City Open University. From the organizing committee of Ho Chi Minh City Open University, we would like to introduce to you Dr. Nguyen Thuy Nga, Dean of Faculty of Foreign Languages, Ho Chi Minh City Open University, Chair of the organizing committee. Dr. Lê Thị Thanh Thu, Member of Organizing Committee. Dr. Bùi Thị Tục Quyên, Head of Department of foreign, General Foreign Languages, Member of Organizing Committee. Dr. Lê Thái Tử Quân Mr. Lê Đình Bảo, Coordinator of the Conference from the, from the press, we would like to introduce Người Lao Động Newspaper Giáo dục và Thời Đại Newspaper At TV Television Nhịp Sống Trẻ Newspaper VOH Radio and representative from the government website of Ho Chi Minh City and the participants of nearly 150 school teachers, lecturers, educators, PhD students, researchers and other ELT professionals. And now we would like to invite Professor Dr. Nguyen Minh Ha, President of Ho Chi Minh City Open University, to get to the stage to have a few words for the opening ceremony. Please welcome Professor Dr. Nguyen Minh Ha to the stage. Distinguished speakers, delegates, scholars, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to declare the opening of the 11th Open Diesel International Hybrid Conference and welcome all of you on-site and online from all over the world. We are delighted to have more than 300 participants on-site here on our Vaubonton campus, Ho Chi Minh City, Owen University. 
and many more attending online from different universities, institutes, and organizations from different countries with us today to exchange experience and expertise on exciting field of innovating pedagogy and technology for language education. That many of you join us today is uh, showing us how we care about education and for collaborations in language education during these challenging periods. I first wish to attend to you the reading from Ho Chi Minh City Open University. We are proud to host this highly regarded conference for this special 11th time. The Open TESO International Conference Series was established in 2012 at Ho Chi Minh City Open University, a higher education institution offering a variety of programs ranging from on-site to distance online learning and learning at satellite academic, academic centers promoting a society with the active learning by offering the most flexible and attainable methods to enrich the country's human resources. Open TESO is a conference for local and international professionals in the field of foreign language teaching and learning. For the past three years, Open TESO International Conference went online due to the COVID-19 pandemic and still serves as the communication hub for language education. It has been recognized as a valuable professional development opportunity for practitioners and researchers in the Vietnam and other countries attending annually at a conference venue or online. We have established the quality channel for sharing ideas of approaches about coaches in different teaching and learning contests, provide opportunity for building a network for of the teachers and those professionals involved in language teaching and connect local communities with international language education institutions or associations. For the 11th in conference, innovating both pedagogies and technology, we first time go hire con connecting the world of language education online and on-site. Finally, I would like to thank the keynote speakers, presenters for, for your insight contributions. I look forward to hearing your sharing. Thank you all participants for your attend presence here. I truly hope that you would love the networking and sharing of opportunity this conference presents. And I have to extend further thanks to all sponsors of conference and staff of Ho Chi Minh City Open University who greatly have in organizing the conference. I wish all of you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Nguyen Minh Hè. And now I would like to invite to the stage the representative of a regional language office, U.S. Embassy Hanoi, on the stage to have a few words. Oh, thank you, thank you. Good morning, Dr. Winmin Win Min Ha, President, Ho Chi Minh City Open University, teachers, educators, and students. Uh, my name is Jerry Frank. I'm the Regional English Language Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi, and my job is to promote English language learning and teaching on behalf of the U.S. State Department all across Vietnam in addition to Laos and Cambodia. So I'm very, very impressed, as always,
but the dedication of Vietnamese teachers and educators to get up early on a Saturday morning to come and enhance their professional development. I, I don't know how you do it, but I admire you. So a big thank you uh, to Open University for all their hard work in bringing us together today and to share best practices, to network, and to discuss trends that will inform our work. And also congratulations to Open University on the 11th anniversary of this conference. 11 years is a big achievement, and I think we need to give you a big round of applause. I believe this is the first one uh, since uh, COVID, the first in-person uh, meeting. So that's great that we're back to normal and we're working together to improve our practices. Our office, the Regional English Language Office, is very proud to play a small part in this year's conference as we were able to invite Dr. Elizabeth Plummer to join us virtually to give some plenary remarks. Dr. Plummer is an English language specialist funded by the U.S. Department of State. And we plan to bring Dr. Plummer over to Vietnam in person this summer to do a series of workshops on academic literacy. She'll be in Hanoi, Kenta, Mae Tho, Le Trang, and here in Ho Chi Minh City. And we'll also be bringing six other specialists to Vietnam this summer to do programs for novice and pre-service teachers, project-based learning, and academic writing. And hopefully, some of you here today will be able to participate in some of these sessions. And for those of you who want to know more about some of our programs, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Win Tran, who is sitting in the front, and uh, she can tell you more. Win, why don't you stand up and wave at everybody? So she's the person to know in Ho Chi Minh City if you want to do anything with the U.S. State Department regarding English language learning and teaching. Supporting English language learning and teaching are core priorities of U.S. diplomacy in Vietnam. As you know, learning English breaks barriers, promotes economic development, and has the power to strengthen people-to-people -people relations. Our office, the Regional English Language Office, aims to support the capacity of teachers and learners by bringing specialists like Dr. Plummer here to speak at this conference, by placing in-person and virtual English language specialists and fellows at universities across the country, and, and by providing opportunities for underprivileged youth through our English Micro Scholarship Program and our English Works Program. Uh, also, we offer uh, numerous virtual and in-person professional development opportunities for teachers. And again, Wayne is the person to talk to if you want to work with us in our office. Our programs are need-based, and we re rely on you to tell us the types of programs we should develop. And we hope after you get to know us, that we'll have many, many requests for uh, future collaboration together. As teachers, you are the front lines of education, working day in and day out to break down barriers and help Vietnamese youth and people in the workforce to reach your full potential. Teachers, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the work that you do every day. We very much appreciate it. We gather here today to share expertise and best practices to improve our teaching and learning, and connect with teachers from across Vietnam, across the region, and across, my, across the world. It is my sincere hope that the conversations you start here today, that you have during this conference, will continue, and that you'll stay in touch long after you go home and get back in your own classrooms and you stay connected with each other. So please stay in touch with each other. Please stay in touch with us. Please think of ideas that we can do to work together. And again, congratulations to Open University, the organizers, the organizing committee, all the people who work behind the scenes to make this happen. We really appreciate it. And congratulations, teachers and presenters, for all the work that you do every day. I hope you have a great conference. I hope you learn a lot. I hope you learn a lot from each other. And please talk to me during the break. So good luck. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gerard. Uh, please remain on the stage. Uh, and I uh, would like to invite a re representative from Oxford University Press, Matt Millen, Cengage Learning, to the stage to receive flowers and gifts from the host.
and we would like to invite Professor Dr. Nguyen Phan Ha, President of Ho Chi Minh City University, Open University, and Dr. Nguyen Thuy Nga, Chair of the Organizing Committee, to get to the stage and present flowers and gifts to our sponsors. Thank you. Uh, in order to change the atmosphere a bit, uh, and uh, by the way, our singers have uh, come back, so um, they will bring to us uh, some fresh air uh, for uh, the tense moment. And uh, welcome to the stage to duet. Uh, there are uh, students of uh, the foreign languages of uh, Ho Chi Minh City Open University. Please uh, welcome Trúc uh, Ngân and Trúc uh, Quyên and. Um, Thuy Linh, uh, they will bring to us um, Hello Vietnam.
May I send my sincere thanks to the lively performance of our students. And now, I would like to invite Dr. Nguyen Thi Nguyen to get to the stage to make an opening speech. Please welcome Dr. Nguyen Thi Nguyen. Good morning, good afternoon. And good evening, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizing committee, I'm greatly honored to welcome you to the 11 Open TESO International Hybrid Conference 2023. <laughs> we come back here on site, face to face, and virtually. Welcome you on site to our lovely Valentin campus, Ho Chi Minh City, and virtually from all over, all over the world. Established in 2012, Open TESO has made its impact on ELT professionals and friends within and beyond Vietnam. On this special occasion, Open TESOS is honored to host feature and keynote sections by Dr. Elizabeth Bloomberg from the USA, Dr. Dat Bao from Australia, Mr. Colin Finnerty and Dr. Natalian Owen from the UK, and Mr. Andrew Dunas from National Geographic Learning based in Vietnam. We appreciate the sponsorship and support from Regional English Language Office, U.S. Embassy, Hanoi, Vietnam, Oxford University Press, National Geographic Learning, and Macmillan Education. After three virtual conferences, we miss you and would like to reconnect the professional on site. However, we don't want to miss the people online. That's the reason why hybrid modes were chosen to connect all of us here and those who fly away and could not travel to Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you for your arranging, being here in person or virtually. A quick look at the list of presentations shows the amazing diversity of presenter teaching context and the topics they bring to us. The conference program features around 60 presentations on site via Zoom and YouTube, covering themes related to blended learning, online interaction and engagement, digital literacy approaches, EAP, language skills instruction, assessment, teaching Chinese and Japanese also. We are sure that this conference will be a memorable, highly educational and not to be missed event in second and foreign language learning and teaching in the region. conference will promote French friendship and cooperation among the participants. Thank you all again for your meaningful presence and participation here. I wish all of you a very pleasant, fruitful and rewarding exchanges. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nguyen Thuy Nga. And ladies and gentlemen, as our regular practice to make today's special moments become tomorrow's memories, we would like to invite all of the three keynote speakers, our sponsors, and the Regional English Language Office, Oxford University Press, 
Macmillan and Cengage Learning and the organizing committee of the International Open TESOL to proceed to the stage for group photos. We would like Dr. Boy Thế Tok Quyên uh, to read the bio data of our first keynote speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Plummer. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Are you ready for the first uh, keynote speech? Yeah. All right. Before we uh, yeah before we start our uh, first uh, keynote speech, I would like to briefly. Uh, give some information about uh, our yeah, speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Plummer. Uh, Dr. Plummer has taught English. Uh, she has taught English learners and teachers from the U.S. to Madagascar and everywhere in between, in person and online, for more than 20 years. Her areas of specialization are in online language education, computer assistive language learning, and faculty development. She holds a doctoral degree from the University of Iowa and is currently a faculty member of the ESL and bilingual education at American College of Education. She loves to engage in the language of crafting and giving high fives. Right. Uh, yesterday, we had a um, very engaging pre-conference workshop from uh, Dr. Blummer, and uh, we are looking for another very interesting speech from her. Yeah, thank you.
because it can lead to a loss of memory. It is a reminder rather than a true art of memory. What technology do you think that they were talking about? We have some interesting answers in the, in the chat. People think it's AI. Well, this technology, they're talking about writing. So this is Socrates. Sometime between 370 and 360 BC, he said this about writing. The funny thing about this is that we know that he said this because someone wrote it down. Let's look at the next one. The technology is, danger, is a dangerous instrument in the hands of youth. I fear that the use of the technology in schools is doing much to injure the rising generation. What technology do you think that they were talking about? Would you like to hear some uh, response from the participant? <laughs> we don't necessarily have time because we're really short on time this morning. So just tell the person next to you um, and then wait to see the answer. So if we had time, I would, but we are short on time today. So this technology is the pencil. Did you get it right? In 1834, the author William McApee Thackeray believed the pencil was a threat to writing because students would be careless because because they could erase their writing. So it was not suitable for formal writing. Let's move to the next one. This technology is a powerful tool, but it can also be a crutch. If students rely too heavily on the technology, they may never learn. It should not be used as a substitute for real world practice. What technology do you think they were talking about? Oh. This one, they're talking about Google Translate in 2017. Did you know that Google Translate is artificial intelligence? So if you said artificial intelligence, you got it right. Specifically, they're talking about Google Translate. And I was very, very um, uh, involved in sort of the discussions around Google Translate and how teachers were so worried that it was going to change foreign language education for the worst. But since then, it hasn't done a whole lot to change it for the worse. Okay, one more. This technology has the potential to revolutionize education but it also has the potential to ruin it. It is important for educators to be aware of the potential risks of this technology and to use it in a way that is beneficial to students. What technology do you think that they're talking about? So in this one, they're talking about artificial intelligence, specifically about generative AI, where art, AI generates text and images and things like that. Um, and this is the AI that's been in the news the most recently. So this was written by Dr. Daniel Ernst, who's a professor at Texas Women's University just recently. Um, so how did you do? Did you find something interesting um, in our game? Uh, before I move on to the rest of my presentation, I want to talk just briefly about ways to classify artificial intelligence. So there are different types of models, and the one that I think is the easiest to kind of understand is one where they classify artificial intelligence in three ways. Um, and so artificial general intelligence, which is the one sitting here in the middle, is artificial intelligence that is like a human. So it behaves like a human, it can create things like a human. So this is human-like artificial intelligence. So that's artificial general intelligence. So artificial super intelligence is better than a human. So these are like superhumans, but they're artificial. 
and then artificial narrow intelligence. That is artificial intelligence that can only do one specific task. And right now, all of the artificial intelligence that is out there is artificial narrow intelligence. Um, as I was consulting with experts in the field, they said there's one caveat that this artificial narrow intelligence that it can be used to do things it wasn't originally programmed to do, although it has to be trained and it still has to be within the parameters that it was originally trained on, right? So we're working with this kind of artificial intelligence. Let's talk a little bit about learning with artificial intelligence. So what are some of the benefits that we can have when we're learning English with artificial intelligence? So this student said, it is when I feel like I am learning the language the most at a level that is perfectly tailored to my language knowledge. And we're talking about personalized learning, right? And who is this learner? This is actually what I said. And I have been learning Vietnamese on Duolingo. And in Vietnamese, they have um, on Duolingo, they have personalized learning that's indicated by the weight. And that's where the AI program has looked at your mistakes and your errors throughout the lessons and creates a series of lessons specifically tailored to you. And they are my absolute favorite lessons to do um, as I'm practicing Vietnamese. And I absolutely love that they've personalized this to me and I feel like this is what I need to work on. And I think that those lessons are the most close to doing what Krashen says that we should do in language in, uh, um, learning is provide comprehensible input that is just one level above where the students are. And when I'm doing those lessons, that's what I personally feel. Um, AI can provide students with real-time feedback. This student says, I love this chatterbot. I feel shy in class and I cannot speak. Here I can speak anything I want. And they're not afraid of those mistakes that they make. So they can have this conversation in this low stress environment. And this example here, a beginning level student is chatting with ChatGPT having just a simple conversation. Hello, what's your name? And anytime they're correcting or confirming students' language, they start it with correct. So that way the student can have this kind of feedback from the, the, um, uh, from the, the chat uh, without feeling too much pressure or too much stress to get it right. What else can AI do for language learning? It can be a research assistant. So this student says, when using it for help on school assignments, it helps me gather research or understand the topic a lot better and faster. So this particular AI, which is called Elicit, students can use as a research assistant. So for my students who are advanced uh, writers, they, uh, can use this particular AI tool in order to ask a specific research question. And then in the middle column, it provides a series of research articles related to that question. And then the great thing that I really love is that on the far right column, it says abstract summary. And my students sometimes struggle with reading those really lengthy abstracts. Um, and so this provides them with a summary of the abstract that's a little bit easier for them to understand so that they can um, do a little bit more work in getting quality research. AI also can give us greater access to language learning. So this student says, when used as a learning and reinforcement tool itself, it can provide a wealth of otherwise inaccessible knowledge. What are some ways that it can provide Accessibility. I don't know if you've ever used auto captioning, but I use auto captioning all the time in my online courses when I'm teaching. And I love auto captions. 
One of the things I love about auto captions is that it saves me time. One of the things I don't love about auto captions is sometimes they get them wrong or you get really interesting captions like makes I don't know sound. What on earth does that mean? It can also help it with um, pronunciation through text to speech or speech recognition programs. Um, so these have been in development for more than 15 years. Uh, Rosetta Stone's been developing them. Iowa State University has been developing them. How can we analyze the pronunciation of students to help them improve their pronunciation? It also can get students access to more languages so that they can get uh, information in languages to be um, uh, comprehensible to them. So perhaps they're trying to understand a complex grammar topic um, and they're not getting it. So they can ask AI to explain it to them in another language to help them to understand. With some of those benefits come some challenges. The first one I want to talk about is inequitable access. So some individuals fear that increased reliance on AI will lead to one or more two-tiered system. The poor might be stuck with inferior AI-driven assistance. And you might end up in a place where your AI is so slow that it's not useful because you cannot access the more powerful AI systems. AI right now, because it's in that narrow focus, often needs training, right? So this student says, I think the concept is decent, but it needs to be very much advanced upon before it can be used frequently. Because there's a lot of things that have to go into some of these AI programs in order to get them to do what it is that you need to do. For example, I showed you that chat that my beginning student was having with ChatGPT. In order to get ChatGPT to do that chat, I had to provide it with this prompt. This is a really long prompt in order to get it to talk to a beginning level student. And no beginning level student would be able to formulate this prompt on their own. So I have to give it to them and they don't really understand it. They just know this is what allows them to talk with ChatGPT. The accuracy is in the news a lot right now. Um, so this student says it was very powerful, but inaccurate. Sometimes chat GPT kept changing its answers when I asked it the same question over and over. So I asked chat GPT to give me some basic instructions for making bread at an A1 level and it provided me something that was way beyond an A A1 level on the CEFR. So then I asked it, I said, that's much higher than A1. And it says, I'm sorry, I'll put it in simpler terms. And then what it gave me was not really that much more simple. Uh, and when I talked to, to it about it more and said, that's not really that much simpler, they said, well, sorry, sometimes the tasks are beyond the language level you're asking for. And if that's the case, I'm going to give you the task as opposed to the language level. And the last one I wanna talk about is that students will become competent without comprehending. So this student says, one of my biggest worries is that I would rely too much on these tools and lose the capacity for critical and creative thought. And that's a concern of mine as well. I want students to think critically about what they're con consuming. And I want my classes as they're um, learning English and developing English to think critically about the world. So let's move on to some teaching with AI. So we talked a little bit about that in learning with AI of things that we can do for our students to help them learn. In addition, there are things that we can do to help as we teach with AI. So some teachers can use this technology for making personal lesson plans for students so that they can be more successful. Or some teachers can use it to give highly detailed feedback on a student's work. This is from a student, a high school student. This is what they said about these things. 
So I like to use BARD, the AI BARD, to help me build lessons. So in this particular lesson, I'm looking for BARD to help me with um, a technology to help my stu intermediate students get more practice with listening and st speaking. So the first thing that BARD does is it provides me a list of potential technologies that I can use. And then I chose VoiceThread. I really like VoiceThread for listening and speaking. And then I asked BARD to give me a lesson for the students at that level using um, VoiceThread on who is a better driver. So then it gave me a lesson and I wasn't quite completely happy with that lesson. So I asked BARD to adjust the lesson so that it was a debate. And so then it adjusted that lesson plan so that it was a debate. And then I was able to take that lesson and use it with my students with just a little bit of adaptation. So something that would normally take me a couple of hours took me about 10 minutes. AI has been studied for a while in relation to student engagement. And so this particular study um, found that participants were motivated to study and learn through the opportunity of speaking directly with a native like speaker. Right. So this is from 2020 um, talking about chat box, chat box, chat box. Let's get that right. Right. And what is another example? So uh, De Haas, Vought, and Kramer, they used robots to teach vocabulary to children, and they found that the ability for AI to provide that feedback in an adaptive way increased the engagement in the students because they're getting information at the level that they need, that um, comprehensible input, just one level above where they are. When I think about my role as a teacher in this world of AI and teaching, I think about the importance of teaching critical thinking. Um, this is an example of something a, a student um, uh, did in their, in their class. They said, a teacher at my school recently asked her class to use ChatGPT to write papers on the novel they were reading in class. The students also wrote their own papers and compared the results. They found this teaching method to be extremely accommodating and productive as they worked to use AI to develop those critical thinking skills. Something that I like to do in terms of not just um, having students write, but also thinking about building other skills is that um, I have my students um, practice vocabulary using adaptive AI and then we come together and we discuss things using the vocabulary and the structures that they've learned. For example, I might have my students use a program to learn the vocabulary of food and simple structures of conducting, of, of talking about food, such as I eat soup, I like bread. Um, and then we will come together and we will work on looking at this, uh, a particular thing that's created by AI and using the language that we have. So this particular um, picture was created with the AI, um, uh, generative AI program called Leonardo. And what I asked it to do was to create a picture of a typical Vietnamese dinner. And I don't know if this is correct or not. I hope to find out if this is correct or not. But if I have my students come together, they can talk about this even at a beginning level. I like this. Um, I eat this. I don't eat this. When I move on to my intermediate level students, I can have them ask AI to create the picture and then to talk about it. And they might discuss what they found in the picture that was generated, or they might write something. When I move on to my advanced students, I might have my advanced students do something similar to what that student that I showed previously. But I'll have them have AI develop several different kinds of, of, of pictures and then compare across the pictures to see what kinds of prompts developed what kinds of pictures. And they can talk about these in person, in groups, as we explore what it is that AI is producing. 
So we've talked about learning. We've talked about teaching. We need to talk about some of the challenges associated with teaching AI, with AI. And I don't know about you, but I'm really concerned about the privacy of my students, right? Um, and what they found in research is that a majority of ed tech companies use extensive tracking technologies and share students' personal information with third parties. Um, and this is very concerning to me if I'm asking my students to sign up and use these technologies. We also know that AI Generative AI especially is based on large data sets. So when, when they are pulling those data sets, they're pulling our information in order to train these programs. So they're using our knowledge, our information um, to train them, and that can be very concerning. Um, one of the other things that I think about when I think about privacy is that these companies often are located in very specific countries around the world and their beliefs and values about privacy might be different than my own beliefs and values about privacy and so am i going to push off onto another culture another country uh, to determine what is safe for me as an individual and as a teacher and what is safe for my students um, the main thing that I think about when I think about privacy, especially with my um, uh, uh, students that are at the beginning levels, is that often they don't have enough language to understand the privacy agreements. So if I'm asking them to use something, they are trusting that it's safe for them to use, that I have made sure that it's safe as a teacher before I have them use it because they're agreeing to things that they don't fully understand because those privacy agreements are often only available in English. The other challenge is that not all AI um, is the same. And so they all carry with them their own bias. Uh, so the, the, they have found that the problem with this type of machine learning is that the training data may reflect human bias, which the algorithm will then learn and replicate. And so then we're perpetuating the biases that are out there in the world, which may not be positive for us and our students. Uh, so as I'm looking at you know, AI and the things that it's generating, I'm using those critical thinking skills with my students and saying, what kinds of biases is it pushing out there? Does it match the kinds of things that we believe or are there incorrect in inconsistencies in it? One of the really big things having to do with AI is cheating. So I would be remiss if I didn't include this in one of the challenges. Um, so this student says, it can be used productively, but unethically, because it is easier to cheat and just copy whatever the AI is providing. Um, and I agree, it is much easier, especially when you're tired and it's late at night or when the subject is hard, it's easier to have someone else do it, do it for you. When I think about cheating, I think that um, uh, we often see cheating specifically with AI, we often see people sit upon a continuum and in regards to AI use and cheating. Um, and so on one side of that continuum are people who say, we shouldn't have any AI and we shouldn't allow anyone to use AI. On the other side, they say, let's just use it. Everyone should, should use it. We should have this really, really great um, uh, class and we should be able to use AI however much that we want. Regardless of where you sit within that continuum, whether or not you think that AI should be banned or whether or not you think that you should welcome AI, it's important to understand that um, it does open this potential door for students to use AI to complete assignments. And you can um, work against cheating um, in your class in several different kinds of ways. You could use an AI writing detector. Um, and so these are programs where you put the text in and they tell you whether or not they think it was uh, written by AI or written by a human. 
Now, last month, uh, the researchers at Stanford University published a paper um, where they submitted to seven different AI writing generator writing detectors, uh, TOEFL papers, so uh, exam uh, essays from the test of English as a foreign language. And of those out of the seven AI detectors, they misclassified that text as being written by AI 61.22% of the time. It's more than half of the time it misclassified the non-native English speakers writing as AI. So for me, I look at that and I think, this is probably not a good tool to use with my English language learners. And in my own personal experience over the past two months, I've noticed this as well, because these AI writing detectors, they find formulaic kind of speech, which is the kind of speech that I teach my students, especially at the intermediate level, so that they can learn how to write in, in, in the way that we write. You could ask your students to show their work. Uh, so this is something that I sometimes do. You can use AI or not. I don't require my students. If you use AI or if you don't use AI, you have to show me the work, the steps that you took in order to come to the completion of the assignment. And that way I can see how they are using AI. You can engage in project-based learning. This is where students complete projects as opposed to written assignments, which is what we're really concerned about with some of these generative AI. Or you can have students draw on their own personal experiences. In my experience, my students love to talk about themselves. So anytime I can have assignments where they're drawing on their own experiences, they absolutely love it. One of the things that I'm really concerned about with AI and language learning is the lack of human interaction, right? So this student says, I personally believe that the use of AI chat box and AI in school and dangerous. Why write a bot? Uh, write, why write if a bot does it for me? Why learn when a bot does it better? I don't have to have this human interaction. I can just have a bot do it for me. The student says, if you want to learn about something, then you should probably resort to asking the teacher. The teacher is way more reliable than any internet source. One of the things that our students are really saying right now is that um, uh, perhaps we're using too much technology. Uh, perhaps there's too much going on and I really want to have that human interaction experience. Um, and we're getting short on time, so I'm going to move on so we can finish up. Uh, the last thing is um, tech fatigue. Um, so I mentioned this, students can get really tired. I can get really tired. Uh, tomorrow when I'm finished, I will have a tech-free day, right? I will uh, answer any of my students' emails because I teach online, so I get emails from students all the time, and then I won't get on tech for the rest of the day um, because I get tech fatigue. So thinking about the future of AI, I can't predict the future. I can predict the, fat, the past. I'm sitting in the past right now, but I can't predict the future. But I do think that AI is going to continue to make mistakes and provide inaccuracies, such as here, AI has classified this really lovely cat as a dog. I think AI will continue to get better, right? So in this particular meme, what if I told you that your up and down votes are used to build a meme AI? I think that will be important for teachers. If you can't understand, I asked Leonardo to give me a meme that shows the importance of teachers in the field of AI. And this is what I got. And if I didn't know any better, and I didn't realize that this wasn't real text, I might push this out there to the world. So we need teachers to be a part of this conversation and to um, be a part of making sure that AI is working for our students. Just for fun, here's one of the other ones that they gave me. And I see a lot of problems with this in terms of the students that they've chosen and um, in terms of the way that they sort of have constructed this that I would wanna talk with my students about. 
So as promised, you can get access to this presentation by this QR code. And I'm going to post in the chat the link for those who are on Zoom. This includes access to the selected list of references. Uh, most of them are things that have come out in the last six months on AI, but a few other really, really great studies. So, in the words of my very, very smart AI teacher, Cam Thong, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blummer. Okay, Do we, yeah, we have uh, some minutes for Q and A. So. Uh, if you have any questions or sharing, yeah, please. Um, doctor, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, I really appreciate your presentation because it's quite interesting, engaging, and it really is inspirational. A, I, actually, I do not have a question for you, but I have a question about the way you can control the, the content of your presentation because it's quite new to me and I'm really impressed by what you have done so far. Yep. Yes, so you want to know about this software. Yeah, and then you can control everything on the screen. Is it by yes. PowerPoint or something else? Yes, well, I actually knew that someone would ask me, so it is called Prezi, ah. and this particular presentation was done using two different Prezi products. Ah. The presentation itself is, is built in, in Prezi Present, mm -hmm. and then Prezi Video is what you use to put it on your video screen. So you build it in Prezi Present, and then you use Prezi, Prezi Video to present it live. Can, can we do it with the basic account, or we need to pay for more? You can do it with the basic account. When you do it with a basic account, um, it puts a watermark that says Prezi. I think it goes in this part of the screen. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, doctor. Yes, so when you sign up for an account, if you don't have an account, it's all the way in the top right-hand corner where it says continue to basic, where you can get that basic yeah. account. Any more questions from the audience, please? Yes, we have one more. Hello, thank you for your presentation. So uh, I have an adult learner, and she used AI while she uh, do the uh, what she did the homework I assigned for her, and I know it because based on my teaching uh, experience of when I teach when I talk to her, I know that she used AI. So how can I tell her stop using AI for doing the homework without embarrassing her because she's an adult learner and she's independent in learning. So how can I tell her? That is such a great question. And I primarily work with adults as well. And I recently had an adult student have the same thing where they were using AI and I teach online, so I don't get to uh, interact with my students face to face very well, but I did ask for an in person meeting and in that meeting we talked about their most recent submission and I asked them, why did you write this. Why did you make this decision and as they couldn't answer the questions about their own writing they finally said. Yes, I used AI and this opened up the conversation with them, right? So that I could respect them as an adult, but also highlight this is not something that you can do. And we talked about why. And then we talked about things that they could do instead of using AI. How can I support you to complete these assignments? Why are you struggling and feel like you need to use AI? And I was able to provide them with additional support um, that they could that they needed in order to complete the assignments, which was 
they needed to, to, to plan their timing better so that they weren't doing their assignments at the last minute. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, I think uh, is, uh, we come to an end of uh, the first uh, keynote speech, right? Um, thank you very much, right? This is very interesting. We, know, we all know that AI is useful, but the thing is how to use it, right? How to make it uh, beneficial, just to make the student learn something, not cheating, <laughs> right? Okay, so uh, as a token of appreciation from uh, OpenTSO uh, 2023, we would like to present to you um, the certificate, the e-certificate, uh, Dr. Blummer. I absolutely love the e-certificate. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we wish you, all right, we wish you happiness and success, right? And uh, looking forward to having you in other Open Diesel conferences. All right, thank you, Dr. Yes. Blummer. Goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth Plummer and the moderator, Dr. Boiti Tupwi. And I believe that that was a very valuable speech that you get a lot of experience. So ladies and gentlemen, please be noted that our parallel section takes place in the following room stated in the Open Tison program, Recording. which can be accessed via the QR code scanning on name card. This is to notify that all guests and participants of the time to return to the parallel sections at 10.10. 10.